Welcome to our live virtual event today entitled Meal Planning 101, Approachable Tips for Healthy Meal Planning. Before we get started, I want to emphasize that your health is our top priority, and we remain committed to providing you with the highest quality primary and specialty care today and always. We want you to be assured that when you come to one of our Valley Medical Group practices or the hospital for care, your experience will be a safe one. We have established a safe visit protocol that is in effect at all of our Valley Medical Group offices as well as the hospital. For those of you joining us from home, if at any time you have questions, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A portal located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please feel free to submit questions anytime during the presentation. We will have time after the presentation is over to address some questions. Towards the bottom of the email you received from Community Health at valleyhealth.com, which included the link to join this meeting, you will find another link taking you to a survey monkey. Please take a moment to complete the anonymous survey about this program af afterwards. Your feedback is very important to us. For our attendees that are present here at our Lifestyles um, Health and Wellness Center in Mawa, um, please write any questions you have on the index card that was provided to you, and we, we should have time after the presentation is over to go over those and for Jessica to answer your questions. You also have an evaluation form that was given to you. I will be collecting those after the presentation is over. Most live events will be recorded and posted on the website. For a listing of videos on the other health topics, please visit www.valleyhealth.com slash tune into health. We will be updating the site frequently with new videos. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Jessica Cording is a registered dietitian, integrative nutrition health coach, author, and podcaster. She earned her master's degree in clinical nutrition from NYU and completed her dietetic internship at New York Pres Presbyterian Hospital. She's currently the dietitian and health coach for the Valley Hospital's Breast Center. Hi, I'm so happy you guys could all join me tonight. So um, we're gonna be talking about flexible meal planning um, with a special focus on nutrition and lifestyle for uh, risk reduction in terms of breast cancer and other chronic disease. Um, as, as Rochelle mentioned, um, so I'm Jess Cording. I'm a registered dietitian, health coach, author of a couple books. Um, and I work with our breast cancer survivorship and high risk patients to help them improve their quality of life through diet, exercise, and other healthy lifestyle changes and habit building. Um, I also run our social media for Valley Breast Center. If you want to follow along, all one word, no, no caps, uh, Valley Breast Center. I also host a lot of virtual uh, Instagram lives. We do cooking demos and other community events and workshops like this one. So I've also created a lot of content and programming for different companies over the years, um, such as Mind Body Green, Caravan Wellness. Um, I've recorded some guided meditations for the Simple Habit app. Um, and I'm also a certified Pilates mat instructor, just for, for fun. <laughs> so uh, I bring a little of everything to the work that I do here at Valley. My approach is really about small changes. That's why I wanted to talk about flexible, approachable meal planning tonight. Because I feel like sometimes the nutrition and lifestyle space, it can feel really overwhelming when we think about wanting to make positive changes to improve our health. And my goal is always to simplify. Um, I tend to recommend just one to three sustainable changes at a time. That way, as you build new habits, they become your healthy new normal, and you can build from there. So with my patients, I address issues, yes, nutrition, but we also talk about movement, emotional and mental well-being, stress, sleep. It's all part of the big picture. So it's really important to me that I'm providing not just education, but also accountability and support along the way as we work on these physical and emotional well-being changes. So let's just do a quick review of the American Cancer Society guidelines for diet and lifestyle for breast cancer risk reduction. 
Now, my team feels very strongly about this. Um, there is a lot of noise about uh, when it comes to nutrition for breast cancer. Um, the internet is the wild west of health information. It is um, wildly unregulated and can be really overwhelming and sometimes hard to tell what's credible and what's not. So we really make a point of providing evidence-based recommendations to our patients. So uh, it's, it's just as much about what to eat, what not to eat, and also the healthy habits that support those things. You know, we can never say that any one particular food will prevent or cure cancer, but we do have data on food patterns and lifestyle habits that can play a supporting role in risk reduction. So big picture, follow a nutrient-dense plant-forward diet. This has been associated with decreased risk of many cancers, including breast cancer and other chronic conditions beyond cancer as well. Uh, and we'll talk about this more specifically, but one question I get a lot is, okay, so does plant-forward, plant-based, does that mean vegan? Not necessarily. The most important thing that we do know from research right now is just you want lots of plants on the plate, but then the types of animal products you choose does play a role. So according to the ACS guidelines, this healthy eating pattern includes nutrient-dense foods. So thinking about things like fruits and vegetables, legumes, whole grains, healthy fats like olive oil, avocados, nuts and seeds, you know, making those really the bulk of your diet. You know, we tend to recommend an 85-15 approach to healthy eating where the majority of what you're eating is healthy, nourishing food, but then there's a little room for pleasure because that's important too and helps make healthy eating more sustainable. Um, so you want to be making sure that you're eating these foods in amounts that support maintenance of a healthy body weight for your body. Um, so some of the basics, plenty of vegetables, um, especially the really colorful dark leafy greens, uh, things that are red and orange, because those pigments that give those foods those beautiful colors also are really potent antioxidants that play a role in promoting health and fighting disease. So definitely lots of color on the plate. Um, and fiber, that's another really important piece of the picture. So fiber, you're going to get that in legumes like beans, peas, lentils, uh, peanuts are a legume. Um, but also you're going to get fiber from fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, avocados, which technically are a fruit, but they get, you know, there's a lot of confusion. What are avocados? They provide a lot of healthy fats. Botanically speaking, they're a fruit, but they're also a great source of fiber. So lots of colorful fruits. So for example, uh, we know that berries, uh, you know, those beautiful, you know, rich, like purple, blue, red hues are all coming from pigments that also are very powerful antioxidants. And we have a lot of cool research looking at the, the health benefits of those foods. So definitely incorporating some fruit is okay. Uh, a less healthful choice, you know, when it comes to, okay, so what do you eat? What don't you eat? So traditional Mediterranean diet, which is what is recommended for cancer risk reduction in a lot of studies. Um, and the American Cancer Society does point towards a Mediterranean style diet. So we talked about lots of plants on the plate. I tend to recommend filling your plate half with non-starchy veggies, quarter with protein. And then that last quarter of the plate, usually some starch or a combo of starch and some healthy fat, depending on your needs and your preferences. So in terms of what proteins to include, you know, traditional Mediterranean diet leans a lot on legumes, nuts and seeds, uh, fish, uh, with small amounts of poultry and eggs, a um, little bit of dairy products. But we do know from lots of research that limiting red meat and processed meat is beneficial for reducing breast cancer risk and risk of other cancers, other, other diseases. Um, so red meat. Um, I have a colleague, she'll say anything with four legs is an example of red meat. So beef, lamb, pork, those are the most common ones that we tend to see. Um, so the American Cancer Society, you know, they recommend limiting that to a small, a small amount a week. So I'll typically say about a serving a week would be considered a, an okay amount. You know, uh, some people might find they feel better with less than that. It really is individual, but the guidelines are about once a week. Um, so what I typically will say is if you really love beef, you know, then when you're going to have it, have the kind that you really love. It's going to be most satisfying. Or maybe one week you have, you know, a beef dish you really enjoy. And then the next week you're having lamb and the next week maybe it's pork and spacing it out. So you're still getting to enjoy those foods that you, that you like, but it's in a way that's more moderate and more, uh, more appropriate for disease risk reduction. Um, processed meats, we do know it's better to limit processed meats as much as possible. 
So in 2015, the World Health Organization classified processed meats as a class one carcinogen, meaning that we do have enough evidence to show that there is an association between intake of these foods and increased cancer risk. Um, so processed meats, that's like um, deli meat, bacon, sausage, cured in smoked meats and fish, hot dogs. So the less, the, the best with these foods. But that said, if there's a special dish that you really, really love, like it is absolutely okay to have it once in a while. Um, but if it's something that is a more regular part of the diet, I do encourage just experimenting with other substitutes that you might enjoy. Uh, sugar, we get a lot of questions about sugar. Um, while I, and my team will back me up on this, we get very frustrated when people say that sugar feeds cancer. Um, we, we don't have any study to date that shows that you eat sugar and there there is a direct relationship between cancer. Like you don't, eat a cookie and sprout a tumor. Like it thankfully does not work that way. But what we do know from research is that when someone chronically has a high intake of added sugar um, from you know, different foods and beverages that are a regular part of their diet, that over time there can be a cumulative effect leading to things like weight gain, um, high insulin levels, things that may themselves be a increase, have an association with an increase in breast cancer risk. So that's why I tend to recommend with added sugars, limit it to special occasions. You know, if it's your birthday and you want cake, have the cake. If it's, you want to have ice cream with your family this weekend, like that's when to have that. Um, special holiday treats. You know, choosing your moments to indulge so you don't feel deprived. But at the same time, weeding out added sugar in places where it might not really need to be. Like, you know, um, low-fat yogurts you'll see it hiding out, or, you know, wholesome-sounding cereals and granolas, condiments. You know, some, those are some common areas where we might see added sugar hanging out, where those are places we can work on taking it out of the diet, choosing things that have less added sugar. Um, we also know that it's best to limit highly processed foods and refined grain products. So a lot of the packaged snacks and things that are providing maybe a lot of sugar and sodium and some of the unhealthy fat sources, um, but not much in the way of actual nutrition. So those are things, again, uh, special occasion food, something you really love, definitely okay to make room for that as a treat. But day to day, the 85% of your diet, sticking with the minimally processed stuff, lots of nutrients, vitamins, minerals, lean protein sources. Um, I also get a lot of questions about soy. Um, so. As I was saying that you know, plant forward does not have to mean vegan, but you can absolutely include plant sources of protein. Um, so one of the questions I get is soy, is that okay for breast cancer? And absolutely. Um, we actually have a lot of studies showing that soy in its whole form, so like tofu, tempeh, edamame, miso, soy milk, not, even, not only safe for breast cancer survivors, um, might actually be protective. So, and that includes um, people who've been eating soy their entire life in some studies, other studies looking at people who don't start eating it till later in life, including after breast cancer diagnosis, um, and also studies looking at um, on endocrine therapy, not on endocrine therapy. So across the board, it seems that soy is, is a good one to be incorporating into your diet. Um, re researchers recommend, you know, about two to three servings per day would be the max. But at that point, I would say you'd be so sick of it, you have to be like trying to, to hit that. So if you wanna mix things up and have tofu on occasion, you wanna play around with soy milk, um, make tempeh, you know, lots of ways to introduce variety. And edamame is a really popular thing to snack on. It's also great in stir fries and salads. So just another way to add variety with healthy foods. All right, so beyond food, um, we know that some other factors can make a difference. So maintaining a healthy weight over time, you know, that's one of the best things you can do for risk reduction. Uh, limiting alcohol, um, nobody likes it when I say this one, but we do have a lot of research in this area that um, for, for about every seven drinks per week someone has, um, that's been correlated with about a 10% increase in breast cancer risk. So what we tend to recommend based on the literature uh, that limiting alcohol, if you do drink, to three or fewer drinks per week seems to be a good ballpark goal. So when you are drinking alcohol, choose something that you really love and experiment with you know, non-alcoholic beverages that are also going to be satisfying. So that's something that we also talk about a lot. Uh, be physically active. Um, we have so much research on the mental and physical benefits of exercise, and including research on exercise being beneficial for reduction of breast cancer risk. 
Uh, so the American Cancer Society recommends aiming for about 150 to 300 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity. So that might be something like walking, yoga, Pilates, uh, yard work, um, or 75 to 150 minutes per week of more vigorous intensity activity, like jogging, swimming, uh, I don't know, CrossFit, uphill hiking, that kind of stuff. Uh, another important piece, manage stress. Um, and I was very careful to say manage stress because I get really mad when I see providers say to reduce your stress. Um, I don't know what planet that person might be living on, but I think it's when we tell people to reduce stress, you know, there's always going to be stress, right? There's always going to be stuff happening. But what really matters is how do you manage that stress? So looking at um, activities that help you feel calm. Um, exercise is one example. We have a lot of research on the exercise having a potential to help manage stress by you know, endorphins and boosting self-esteem and helping you clear your head. Um, but other things, you know, if it's aromatherapy, meditation, breath work, a hobby that brings you joy, there's so many ways to manage stress. And there's no one right answer. But it is really important to find something that helps manage your stress when it comes up. Um, and then, you know, I know it's 2022 and part of me is like, wow, I still have to say this, but don't smoke. That's another one of the best things you can do to reduce your risk. So let's talk about meal planning. So there's a lot of benefits to planning your meals and it doesn't have to be elaborate. And I'll, I'll share some tips for making it approachable, but some of the benefits to meal planning, saves time, saves energy, saves money. Um, it also helps you stay on track with healthy habits and plan for indulgences. You know, so if you know that you've got a really busy week coming up, it's so easy to just be like, oh my gosh, I don't have time to cook. I'm so stressed out. Let's just get, let's get, let's get fast food. Let's get takeout. Like, and default to some maybe less healthy habits. Or you end up spending way more money than you would like to on purchasing food from outside. Um, so if you give yourself time to plan ahead, you know, you can keep, take stock of what's going on in your week. You know, maybe when you are going to be dining out, kind of like what you're going to, what you're going to order or things that you can prepare ahead of time to simplify cooking in the moment. Um, it also gives you a sense of, you know, when, when do you want to indulge? Is there something coming up in the week where you know you want to make room for something special that might be on that in moderation food list? Um, another one, reducing stress of trying to figure out what to make, what to buy, what to order for your meals. I talk about this with my patients all the time. Um, you know, if you're busy, you've got a lot on your plate, you know, in terms of time management, energy management, emotional stuff. Um, sometimes figuring out what to, f what to cook for yourself or your family can be really overwhelming. So coming up with a plan can really help dial down that drama for you. So some tips for getting started. Um, use your schedule as a guide. Even if you take five, 10 minutes the week before, whether that's on a Friday or over the weekend, just looking at your calendar for the week ahead and kind of paying attention to what do you have going on. This gives you some clues as to, okay, so when are you gonna be home? When might you be on the go? When will you be out? That started to get the wheels turning about what to make, what to buy, etc. cetera. Um, if you live with others, involving them in planning can help a lot, especially if you have a family or a home where everybody has different preferences or different needs. Uh, helping everybody kind of have their say and okay, maybe one night each individual chooses a dish that you're going to have for dinner, for example. You know, that's one way to make everybody feel included and, and cared for. Um, or that said, you know, having um, backups handy for them. If, if you know that, you know, that night you're making fish and your, you know, middle kid hates fish. You know, you have something in the freezer that they're going to eat. Um, another thing I really like to do is to plan uh, food groups rather than exact recipes. Uh, because sometimes it, the recipe stuff can be really overwhelming or you, you haven't gone shopping yet and you don't have time to look at recipes. So thinking about the food groups that you want to have on your plate, you know, that gives you some freedom when you maybe the, the ingredient that that recipe might have called for, you can't find it in the store. You can swap in something else um, or just choose based on what you have at home. So when I shared that formula where you fill half your plate with the non-starchy veggies, quarter with protein and that last quarter of the plate is either, you know, quarter starch or it's a little bit starch, a little bit healthy fat that, you know, you can, what vegetables do you have on hand? Maybe what proteins do you have in the freezer? Um, what starches do you feel like having? Um, you know, uh, do you want olive oil? Do you want some avocados on there? Um, all different ways of making it flexible to suit your needs. Um, and I mentioned this a moment ago, but keeping healthy backup options on hand. 
So this can obviously apply if you have someone in your family who is not going to like what you're serving, because let's be real, that just happens sometimes. You can't please everybody, and I'm giving you permission not to try. Um, but if, or if you just know you're really busy, or you know, I'm sure we've all had that experience where you buy something over the weekend, and when you go to cook it on Thursday, it's looking a little questionable, or those veggies aren't as fresh as they were a few days ago. Um, having some stuff that's going to be easy to throw together, you know, I know for myself, I always keep some eggs on hand, some frozen vegetables. Um, some potatoes. So if all else fails, you know, I can make a frittata or something like that. So it does not have to be complicated. Even healthier frozen meals can be a good resource too. I do encourage checking out labels though, just to weed out anything that's heavy duty on preservatives and sodium and added sugar and things you can't really pronounce or understand. Um, but that can also be a good resource. Another big one, be open to change. This is where the flexibility piece comes in. Because um, our plans change, right? Like it would be great if everything stayed as we planned it, you know, the week before. But things come up, things get canceled, things get added to your schedule. Um, be open to the change, and you know, don't beat up on yourself if your plan for what you're going to be eating has to change at the last minute. I think that's why having a formula in mind of you know your veggies, your protein, your starches, your healthy fats that that can be really useful in those situations where like okay, so I'm not going to get to eat the thing I plan to eat, but I can have something else that's gonna be nourishing and satisfying. Um, this is another of my favorites. Keep a list of your favorite healthy takeout and restaurant items handy. What happens is with decision fatigue, you know, if we are making lots of decisions through the day, by the time we get to dinner or you know, it's time to, to have a meal and you're exhausted from doing everything else you've had to do all day, it can be really hard to have the wherewithal to make that healthy choice. So if you have, if you like to keep physical takeout menus at home and you want to highlight the healthier things that you know you enjoy, you want to keep a, a note on your phone of your favorite healthy restaurant and takeout options, and that's going to be useful to you when you're like, oh, okay, so takeout is happening tonight, what should I order? And you already have a list of some different items that are going to be a good fit for you. So it's not all about cooking everything from scratch all the time. So I wanted to be sure that you know, when we're talking about meal planning, some of it is cooking, but some of it is getting food from outside the home that's still gonna support your goals. So this is uh, the formula that I was sharing with you guys, the overthink proof plate is what I like to call it, because we have enough to think about. All right, so I know I shared with you that plate formula. Um, oh no, let's go back. All right, so what I didn't say about the overthink proof plate is that I tend to recommend this for at least one of your meals, ideally lunch and dinner. Um, but I get a lot of questions, okay, so what about breakfast, what about snacks? Because um, not everybody is on team savory breakfast or wants to eat a bunch of veggies at breakfast. Um, at breakfast, you know, the, the formula that I shared about having the, the balance of protein, veggies, fat, carbs, that's really geared towards blood sugar management, which is the key for keeping our energy up, our mood stable, um, you know, helps us deal with stress more effectively. And at our meals, and, at our breakfast and snacks, we also wanna be supporting that. So at breakfast, make sure you've got something with protein, something with healthy fat, and something with fiber. So, you know, that might look like, if you, if you are an oatmeal fan, maybe you're having oatmeal, you know, made with a little bit of soy milk, and then you're adding a tablespoon of peanut butter on top. Or maybe you're putting some nuts on there, a little bit of blueberries, um, and then maybe, you know, you're um, adding a little bit of ground flax in there for some extra healthy fats. Um, snacks, you want something with fiber, plus some healthy fat and or protein. So a great example might be um, some sliced veggies. As much as you like any kind, you can throw in a little whole grain crackers if you want in there, if you like the crackers. Um, and then maybe some hummus, some guacamole, something that's gonna give you some healthy fat and keep you satisfied. Um, the way that this works is when we eat anything with carbohydrate, you know, as we digest those foods, our body breaks down those starches into smaller and smaller molecules that then enter our bloodstream as you know, usually glucose, fructose, and it gets where it needs to go in the body. And that's how we get energy. It's, you know, it's a normal physiological uh, response that's happening. And we need that to, to function. But what can happen is if we eat those carbs on an empty stomach or we eat too large of a portion of the carbs relative to the protein and the fat, that can mess with our blood sugar, which can mess with our energy, our mood, focus, stress response, all that stuff. 
So um, the fat, the protein, fiber, they help slow down that digestive process. So instead of your blood sugar going up and then quickly down or going up and kind of staying up and you're riding the roller coaster for a while, um, it's a much more slow and steady increase and decrease. So you experience more stable energy, focus, mood. You can roll with the punches a little bit better. Uh, so let's talk about meal prepping for a moment. And I'm gonna share an example in a few minutes of kind of what that can look like. Um, so meal prepping, I know sometimes on social media it can seem like it's an assembly line of like the exact same meal for five meals for the week and you know everything is all laid out. Um, for some people, sure, that might work great. Um, but for others, maybe it looks more like batch cooking, you know, and I'm going to share some tips on this in a moment just to make it a little more approachable, kind of getting started. But in general, taking some time to prepare some food for the next few days, whether you're doing this on a Sunday or a Saturday, or if it's Wednesday night is the time when you have to prepare some stuff. You know, there's really no wrong or right day for this because we all have different schedules, different different things we're doing. But putting it on your calendar so you know when you're gonna be taking that time to prepare a little bit of food for the, the days ahead, you know, that can help make it happen because it's very easy to give our time away, right? Um, so sometimes putting our own name, our own self-care, our own, um, healthy habits on our calendar can help us stick to them. Um, also, make it fun. You know, if you know you're going to be in the kitchen for an hour or two, put on a podcast you love or some music that makes you feel upbeat or productive or watch it, catch up on a TV show or put on a movie that you like. Um, something that's going to help make it an enjoyable experience. You can also break it into smaller pieces. Um, if you don't have an hour, maybe you have 20 minutes one day. Another day you have another 20 minutes. Maybe you have 15 minutes another day. It does not have to be devoting hours and hours to preparing food in, in one, one shot. I'm also a fan of healthy shortcuts. Um, I know, you know it can feel like we have to do it all ourselves sometimes, but hey, buy the pre-chopped produce or the frozen stuff, um, leaning on easy proteins like canned beans or tin fish. Uh, frozen fish is one of my favorites to, to use because it comes usually pre-portioned, like ready to kind of go in the oven, maybe after a quick defrost. Um, and most of the fresh fish that we're buying has been previously frozen anyway, so it's not like you're really missing out that much. Um, th you know, you can even get some pre-cooked proteins if that's helpful for you. Uh, frozen veggie burgers are super convenient. So. There's a whole range of healthy shortcuts to explore. So that's something I do encourage, especially if you're short on time and energy, it can take a lot of the work out of your out of your day. So let's simplify meal prep. I know there's a lot of tiny text on the slide, so I apologize if you're following along at home. Um, but a few things to simplify it. Wash and prep things ahead of time or pre buy pre-chopped, pre-prepared. Um, you can roast big batches of vegetables, for example. Um, I, that's an example batch cooking. You know, so you're cooking it once, but then you're using it for a few different meals. That can be really useful. Um, and using you know the stove, the stove, the stove. I like that. Using the stove or the oven or your slow cooker. Like that's a great opportunity to prepare a big batch of something, whether it's like chicken or fish or tofu, lentils, beans, something you can use for a few different servings. Um, you can also make a big pot of soup or chili. You know, I have a girlfriend, she's got two little kids and her thing she does every week is she makes one big pot of soup and one big pot of chili and that kind of <laughs> gets through a few days. Um, you can, for breakfast, you can do stuff like overnight oats, chia pudding. Um, and these are things, you know, they'll stay in your fridge for a few days. You can do single portions if that's gonna make it easy to grab and go and they don't require any cooking but you're still gonna get a nourishing meal that's ready when you are. And then I also encourage adding some flavor. Um, you know, little accents can go a long way in making some of these plant-forward dishes more of an experience, especially if you're newer to in introducing some of these foods. So, you know, maybe that's like caramelized onions or a recipe I share a lot with my patients is mushroom bacon to add a little savory something. Or making your own salad dressings. It is so easy and you can just keep it in the fridge for a few days. So lots of, and this is just scratching the surface, by the way. This is just a few things to get started with. Some other things for simplifying healthy eating. Uh, try online grocery shopping, or um, you can also do like veggie or protein delivery uh, subscription services. Um, things like CSA and like farmer, um, like farms shares. You can do things like uh, for proteins, you can do ButcherBox, Fish Fix, stuff like that. 
Um, I also recommend stocking your freezer with things like frozen produce, um, some of your favorite healthy prepared foods either that you've purchased or that you've made yourself. Like if you make a pot of soup, stash some in the freezer for future use. Um, you can also, I talked about the frozen fish. You guys are, <laughs> my patients always hear me talk about frozen fish, so I'll, I'll stop talking about that one now. Um, but there's also, too, um, a whole world of healthy meal kit and healthy meal delivery services now, um, especially in the last couple of years. We've just seen that area of the market just explode with all these different options, and some of them are really good. So if that's something that will simplify for you, just you know, choosing a few nights a week to get something from a meal kit service or healthy delivered meals that are already made, I, I support that. All right, so we're gonna do a quick demo and then we're gonna do some Q&A. So, if you guys want to follow me over here, I don't know what it looks like for you guys at home, but I'm going to share one of my favorite easy um, meal prep friendly recipes with you for a, um, a uh, what I call a black bean burrito bowl. Tonight I'm actually going to be working with black beans and pinto beans um, just for a little variety, but I wanted to share this recipe because I wanted to share something with you guys that it's great to enjoy as soon as you make it, but that it also makes really great leftovers too. So um, that way, just to kind of show that you can cook something once and then have some leftovers for the next day or a few days. So all you really need for this recipe is two cans of beans. Um, this is for about four servings. So that's, um, that's gonna be you know, for a meal size serving. I really like working with beans because they are a great example of a plant-based protein. You're getting lots of fiber, plant-based protein. They're a great source of slow-burning complex carbohydrate, and they're so versatile. Um, they're also gluten-free, so okay for people who need to limit gluten. Um, so all I'm doing right now is I'm heating up the beans in a saucepan, as you can see. I mean, pretty self-explanatory. But the key here is really adding flavor with spices. Um, because a lot of, a big question I get is, okay, well, how do I make it taste good? <laughs> so I go, I like to go really heavy on the spices. So here I've got some, some cumin, some paprika, some garlic powder, some chili powder, um, a little bit of black pepper, and I'm just gonna stir that in until it's really well combined. And if you noticed, I didn't mention salt. Um, this is because a lot of canned beans actually have salt already in them. Um, I do encourage rinsing them before you cook with them or you eat them, like if you're putting them on a salad or something, and that gets rid of some of the salt, just because it is a lot of sodium. And if you prefer, you can get no salt added. That's also, um, there's always a lot of options with that as well at most grocery stores. Oh, I also added turmeric in here. Um, I just like to incorporate anti-inflammatory spices as much as possible. And turmeric is one of my favorites. We have so much research on the health benefits of it. So any opportunity to kind of sneak that in, I'll usually take. Um, my husband hasn't noticed yet. Okay, so we're gonna heat that up. Um, so what we're gonna do with this, you know, you can obviously make, um, you know, like tacos with it, but I wanted to show a burrito bowl kind of approach, which works hot or cold. So with this dish, um, I'm gonna serve it with some, uh, some greens, any kind of greens that you like. I have just a mix here. Um, so this is gonna be kind of like a, a burrito bowl kind of salad vibe. Um, and then either some brown rice or some cauliflower rice. Right, I have brown rice right here, but if you are wanting to introduce a little bit more veggies, you could absolutely use cauliflower rice. It also happens to be lower in carbohydrates, so if you are keeping an eye on your blood sugar, um, it's a good one to pair with beans, because beans are really packed with protein and fiber, but they are, you know, they are higher in carbohydrates, so some people who need to be mindful of carb intake to manage their blood sugar for other reasons you know, might do well with having a lower carb pairing with it. Um, and then I also am adding some low sodium salsa. Um, I think this is a, a no salt added one from Trader Joe's that's got a little, little bit of heat. Um, again, just to show that you don't need a ton of salt to be healthy, um, or not a ton of salt to be flavorful, but that said, you can use any salsa that you enjoy here. Um, but I just happen to get a lot of questions about how to limit salt and still make things taste good. So that's why I say, you know, go for things that have a lot of spice, a lot of flavor, um, but that you can always add a little salt later if you need it. Um, and then what we're gonna do 
Um, I also am going to add a little bit of, you could add avocado, guacamole, you could add, forgot to take the top off of this, you could add a little bit of plain Greek yogurt. Um, I really like the Greek yogurt because it, um, it's got more protein than sour cream. It also has beneficial probiotic bacteria. Uh, we have a lot of cool research looking at the potential health benefits of fermented foods like yogurt, kefir, sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, so sink them in where you can. Totally on board with that. Um, sometimes I'll make pickled red onions at home, and that's another way to get in a little bit of fermented foods in there. So all we're gonna do, literally, is just put a big, big serving of the beans into your, to your bowl. Um, so like I said, you could top it with the Greek yogurt, guacamole, you could put, um, if you prefer, you could also add some nutritional yeast, um, or if you want to use a little bit of your favorite um, cheese, that's also an option. I didn't talk about dairy and breast cancer, that's right. Um, the research is very mixed. So, you know, we have some, a few studies showing that high intake of high fat dairy, like cream cheese, um, ice cream, butter, that kind of stuff, you know, that having too much of that stuff might be associated with an increase in risk. And then we have other studies that show that fermented dairy, like yogurt, kefir, um, cultured cottage cheese, you know, might actually be protective. But then the majority of the studies we have as of now on dairy and breast cancer is really mixed and not conclusive. So what I tend to say is if you enjoy dairy, you tolerate it, it serves you, then in moderation, I would say that it's fine. Um, but you know what I would say that if it's something that you're using a lot of consistently, to start experimenting with other stuff that you might enjoy. And I don't necessarily mean the dairy alternatives because they're, they're, they're really not that much better. Um, a lot of them do tend to be very heavily processed, but some are better than others. So either kind of exploring those or for things like you know cheese on a sandwich, maybe you try hummus or avocado or things like that, or you try nutritional yeast instead of cheese on a dish and just experiment, see what else satisfies you and what makes you feel nourished and, and happy. So um, that's my spiel. <laughs> let's open it up to some questions. Um, let's see, I know Rochelle, you are kind of manning some of the questions, correct? Yes. Yes, so our first question is, do you recommend keeping a food journal? Ah, oh, that's a great question. I am, you know, I'm very uh, patient-led on this one with the food journals. Um, and by that, I mean, I feel like if you find a food journal is useful, it helps you feel organized, it helps you stay on track, um, it helps you be accountable to yourself, then by all means, I fully support that. But for somebody who finds uh, food journaling to make them, mix in them a little bit crazy or they get obsessed with trying to count the calories or the macros and they end up feeling very stressed out by it and to the point where it makes them feel like they need to rebel against it, um, then I would say, you know, maybe not a good fit. Or if it triggers um, overly restrictive habits, that's also um, something to be mindful of. But I think that for, if keeping a food journal serves you, I'm very okay with it. But just that you need, you know yourself best and you know, being mindful of what's really gonna give you some benefit is important with that one. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. So the next question is, how much anti-inflammatory benefit is there when you use turmeric as a spice just a few times per week? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we don't have um, a ton of data on like how many times per week. Like we've had studies looking at turmeric in supplement form, usually like as capsules with powder inside and similar things, um, you know, in different, like I think from like, if I'm remembering correctly, like around like 800 milligrams to like two grams, something like that, but don't quote me on that. Um, but that said, um, turmeric does have a blood thinning effect, so you really need to be careful with high doses if you're on any blood thinning medication. It also may interact with some other medications as well. So I always encourage talk to your doctor about turmeric if you're taking any medications. Um, as a food, it's generally considered safe. So if you're using it in your cooking, you know, like a teaspoon here, a teaspoon there, not like pouring like half the container on <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, you know, and I generally would consider it safe for daily use, but if you have a specific health condition or concerned about medication interactions, you know, touch base with your doctor. Uh, they are a good resource for that, or a pharmacist as well would be able to give you some guidance there. Thank you. So I guess when you were talking about the healthy carbohydrates or grains that you could add into the bowl, she's asking about, what about quinoa? 
Uh, so quinoa, technically speaking, is a seed, but its nutrient profile is much more similar to a carbohydrate. So um, quinoa, it, it's very interesting because it's, it, it, it's often labeled as a source of protein. And the reason that is, is because it contains all of the nine essential amino acids that we need to get from food, whereas many other grains don't contain all of them. So it's sometimes, it's technically considered a complete protein in that respect. Um, that said, quinoa only has about five grams of protein per serving. And I tend to recommend for a meal, um, you need about 15 to 30 grams of protein. So as part of a meal that's incorporating some other foods that provide protein, it definitely has its place. And because it's a good source of fiber as well, um, I would definitely say it's preferable in terms of blood sugar management um, and satiety to, you know, over something like white rice or um, another refined grain. But just to know that it's, it's still, um, you know, primarily carbohydrate. So we do need to make sure that we're balancing it with enough protein and enough healthy fat, if that makes sense. All right, thank you. The next question is, do you have a list of names or brands of food to look out for? I guess um, good names, good good brand names versus uh, those that they should avoid. So many. Um, you know, I think one thing in terms of what to avoid, um, anything with like, I mean, obviously a lot of the processed snack foods that are not providing much nutrition. You know, I think all you know all the stuff that you see in the convenience store that's like not even trying to be healthy. Like those are more on the in moderation list, right? But we also wanna be mindful of foods that have a health halo effect, which is where a food is made out to seem that it's healthier than it is. So a good example of this would be like a whole grain cereal. Um, but then you turn it over and yeah, it's made with whole grains, but then you've got like 13 grams of added sugar, which is really not helping. So I think that's some, something to be aware of. If it's making claims on the label and kind of, but then you look at the ingredients, you're like, oh, what, really? Is this actually healthy? Um, you know, and I, in terms of brands, I like um, things to, to buy at the store. Um, so I don't have any financial relationships with any of these brands. Um, I, I tend to look for, in general, nutrient-dense foods, you know, minimal ingredient lists. Um, I try to buy organic produce when I can. Um, frozen is great for that because it makes it more affordable. Um, and oftentimes the store brands, whether you're shopping at Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or ShopRite or Wegmans or uh, Stop and Shop, like their store brands tend to actually have some really good organic options for produce. And um, I do encourage organic poultry when possible, you know, maybe buying it on sale and freezing, freezing it for later use. Um, frozen fish, um, you know, I, again, I buy often the store brands of the, of the wild seafood, um, you know, things like beans, Again, you know, these are something you can, a lot of the store brands are excellent, or you can get, you know, the, the less salt versions. Um, you know, I get a lot of questions about like BPA in cans, and that's less of a concern than it used to be. But if it makes you feel better to look for a product without BPA in the lining, there's that usually information will be on canned foods. Um, I also buy a lot of tin fish. I love sardines. I know that's kind of weird. Um, but Wild Planet is a company I buy all the time. Um, you know, that's not like a, you know, a store brand, but Trader Joe's sardines are totally my jam, especially when they're packed with olive oil. Um, in terms of like fruit, I love Wyman's frozen blueberries. Like we always have some of those in my freezer. I'm obsessed with wild blueberries because they have a lot of fiber. They tend to be a little bit lower in carbohydrate. So from a blood sugar perspective, they're really great. Um, also tons of antioxidants. Um, we have a lot of cool research on, the, men, on the, the benefits to, you know, heart health, brain health, potential, you know, still research looking at potential anti-cancer benefits, but that's newer research. Um, so those are just a few. I could go on and on and on, but I would say that you really can find lots of healthy options at your local grocery store at all different price points um, and not to overlook the store brands. So, um, you know, that's something that I do encourage. Thank you. What's considered in moderation for dairy? How many servings does that mean in a day? Yeah, so that's a really awesome question. And I think that that exact answer is a little different for different people. Um, but if you're having like a serving or two a day and it's high quality dairy, you know, stuff, if it's something, for example, there's a big difference between plain Greek yogurt um, made from organic milk and, you know, like, um, 
low-fat ice cream with tons of sugar in it, right? Like, or American cheese, which legally they can't even call cheese anymore. So I don't remember what their processed cheese product something. Um, you know, so thinking about the type, the quality, um, if it's a fermented dairy product like yogurt or kefir or like cultured cottage cheese, you know, it, like a serving of that, even two servings, if that's what you're relying on for protein, you know, I think can be okay. I wouldn't necessarily do that every single day. But um, more often, I would say with the higher fat dairy products, just again, based on research, using a light touch with those. So I tend to encourage using cheese as a garnish um, as opposed to like having that be like your protein at multiple meals per day. Um, what I would not do is have like, you know, um, I don't know, what's a good example? Like put like a huge amount of cheese on your eggs in the morning and then have more cheese <laughs> like another big giant serving of cheese at lunch and then have, you know, yogurt in the afternoon and then ice cream after dinner. But if you're having a little yogurt in the morning and then you're garnishing your, you know, your pasta with a little Parmesan in the evening, I think that that's a more balanced approach. Um, so, but again, every person is a little bit different. Um, and if you're really unsure, you know, talk to your oncologist. They can be a really good resource. Thank you, Jessica. So aside from cheese, you know, that you recommend to be used more as a garnish. Are there any other um, types of food like that that you would suggest to use as garnishings instead of a main ingredient? Yeah, you know, this is something kind of, um, I was I was asked recently about, you know, processed meat and like, you know, um, if you still really love it and you don't want to give it up completely, um, using that as a garnish, you know, like rather than eating like a whole serving of like bacon, say, maybe you take one strip of bacon and you put that in like some roasted vegetables, like some roasted Brussels sprouts. So that way you're getting a little bit of the flavor, but you're not having a whole serving of it. Obviously, it's not something I would recommend doing all the time, like every day, but if that's something that you want to be incorporating a little bit of it, you know, that's one way to make it more approachable. Um, obviously sugar, that's definitely, I know you don't necessarily see sugar as the, the garnish, but that would be another example of an in moderation food. Um, so uh, another one that comes up a lot is granola. Um, it this is definitely a health halo food. I mentioned that a few moments ago. And granola, um, uh, there, and it's, we're seeing more brands with less sugar, but it is something that I have found in practice tends to be more calorie dense and higher in sugar than most people realize it is. And then when they realize that and they modify their intake, they notice they feel better. Um, so I would say with granola, like rather than dumping a whole half a cup or whatever it says on the label, like using that is like, you know, put a tablespoon on there for a little extra crunch and maybe you're getting your fiber from some berries or some chia seeds or something else that you're, you would normally be eating the granola with. If say you're having it on yogurt or putting it on a smoothie or um, oatmeal, something like that. Or, you know, if you are having, uh, you usually have it for cereal. Maybe you use um, a low sugar cereal, like, I don't know, Cheerios or something like that, and you put a tiny bit of granola to kind of make it, um, you still some of the crunch, some of the flavor, but less sugar. So that's, that, and that's another, that's one example of that. Thank you. The next question is, is goat cheese a healthy option and how much is healthy? Yeah, I love goat cheese. I'm not gonna lie, I eat it. Um, many days of the week. Um, but again, if you're using just like a tablespoon or two as a garnish, like there can be room for that. Um, I actually tend to prefer going for really flavorful cheeses because you're getting more, you're getting more flavor. It's gonna be more of an experience. Whereas a lot of the um, like low fat cheeses and some of like the, sh the shredded cheeses and things that come in the package and are maybe a little, you know, they might be a little blander and then you might feel you have to eat more of those to kind of hit the sweet spot. So. I'm, I'm a fan of goat cheese, and for people who don't tolerate um, lactose very well, it can be a good option. So that way you can enjoy some, some real cheese that happens to be lower in lactose without leaning on some of the heavily processed non-dairy cheeses that really don't tend to offer much in the way of protein or other nutrients. So yeah, that's, kind of, that's how I feel about goat cheese. I'm, I'm team goat cheese. Can you um, clarify like what's what are the healthy oils for the audience again? Oh, I love that question. Um, my patients know I'm a major olive oil fangirl. I talk about olive oil all the time. It's not just because I'm Italian. Um, but no, olive oil is probably my top pick. Uh, we do know that it's rich in heart healthy monounsaturated fatty acids. 
um, which help reduce LDL cholesterol, the bad one, and help increase HDL, the good one. Um, and we know that heart health is really important for breast cancer survivors to focus on, and women in general. So I tend to recommend making olive oil and avocado oil your primary cooking oils. Um, avocado oil is also really great. It's um, like olive oil, it's high, it's high in monounsaturated fatty acids, but it's also um, a little bit more, you can heat both of them to pretty high temperatures, but avocado oil, you can heat it um, a little bit higher, and it also has a more neutral flavor. So if you're cooking something where you don't want the olive oil flavor, it's a really good uh, alternative. So, um, and when it comes to things like butter versus margarine, coconut oil, like, I, you know, if obviously if you don't tolerate dairy or you are on a vegan diet, coconut oil is good for recipes where you want that specific flavor and texture. Um, but when it comes to butter versus margarine, I am very much pro butter if you're going to be using one of those. Um, it's less processed. Um, you know, often margarine has different stabilizers and things added to give it that texture, which are not super healthy. Um, so if there's a, but I tend to recommend using that, you know, sparingly. Like if there's a specific recipe that calls for butter, it's just not going to taste the same with olive oil. Then I, I respect that. Like you make that specific recipe with butter. But if it's something that you really won't miss the butter, and you can just swap in olive oil or avocado oil, I do encourage doing that because you're going to reap more health benefits, and it's still going to taste delicious. The next question we have is, what supplements do you recommend for women? It's really an individual thing. Like, I definitely recommend having a conversation with your healthcare provider about supplements. Um, I tend to use supplements very sparingly to cover gaps in the diet. Um, that said, some of the most common deficiencies are uh, vitamin D is a big one. So definitely get screened um, for vitamin D and your provider will give you recommendations if they think you need a supplement. Um, you know, and if someone is eating a primarily uh, vegan diet, where you know they're not really doing any dairy, they're not doing any a lot of animal products. Um, sometimes B12 is a vitamin that a lot of people overlook, so that would also be something to talk to your healthcare provider about if you're eating primarily plant-based but want to make sure you're covering your nutrient bases. Um, beyond that, you know, um, so a supplement that I find myself frequently recommending is a probiotic supplement with prebiotics um, to support gastrointestinal health. Uh, probiotics, they're the beneficial gut bacteria that help fight invading pathogens, promote digestive regularity, which is really, and keeping our gut healthy is really important for not just, um, you know, digestive comfort, but immune system function, mental and emotional well-being. We have a lot of research now in that area developing. Um, prebiotics are a type of fiber that provides fuel for those probiotic bacteria. But again, definitely talk to your healthcare provider before starting a new supplement. Those are just a few common ones that come up in my practice, but every person is different um, and every person has different needs. Um, and if you're currently on any kind of treatment, um, like cancer treatments, definitely want to talk to your doctor before starting any supplements because some supplements out there may actually interact with treatments. So they're not you know, something you can just take like candy. But I, oh, that, speaking of candy, I'm not a fan of gummy vitamins. <laughs> Um, I find it really fascinating that we live in a culture where, um, and I can't tell you how many times this has happened, where someone will say, I'm, I can't eat a banana, it's too high in sugar, you know, sh bananas have too much sugar. And yet, um, we're being marketed these gummy vitamins that have added sugar in them. And I, you know, it's like, we're kind of conditioned to think that eating a banana is too much sugar. But hey, like eating 30 grams of sugar from gummy vitamins a day is virtuous and healthy. Like, no, like, I'm not a fan of the gummy vitamins, so I'm sorry if that's an unpopular opinion, but that's what I have to say about gummy vitamins. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. The next question is, what are your thoughts on digestive enzymes? Again, that's really individual, because there's so much to consider with that, you know, depending on um, pancreatic function, you know, if someone's um, ability to digest is compromised in some way due to a medical condition or surgery or some other some other thing. That's just one example. Um, but if you are having difficulty with digesting food, I think it's worth having a conversation with your provider to see if they think that pink, um, if they think digestive enzyme supplements are something that would benefit you. All right. Um, one other question. You had mentioned um, fermented or pickled foods before. Can you explain that a little bit better? What are considered healthy and how much and what should they watch out for? Yeah, 
Yeah, so fermented foods, um, the, the, way, the reason they're believed to be beneficial is that they do provide some probiotic bacteria, so those, those good gut bacteria. Um, and a few examples of fermented foods, things like yogurt, kefir, um, cultured foods, um, so whether that's like a cultured coconut yogurt you'll see, or cultured cottage cheese, so cottage cheese with probiotic bacteria in them, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, um, also, um, you know, kombucha is a beverage that is uh, also pro it has the probiotic bacteria, um, and it's it's a uh, we don't have an exact recommendation for how much, how often. You know, I tend to just encourage working them in liberally through the through the day, um, but just to be mindful that with some of the pickled um, like vegetables and fruits and things, you know, sometimes there is a lot of sodium. So, you know, sauerkraut, for example, unless you're making it yourself without salt, you know, you are going to see a lot of sodium in there. So if you need to limit your sodium intake, definitely use a light touch. Um, you know, and there's a lot of schools of thought on this. I tend to agree with people who, um, you know, with healthcare providers who will say that we really, there are so many different types of um, probiotic gut healthy bacteria, so many varieties, and they all perform slightly different functions. And in order to continuously populate our gut with these good guys, you know, um, we'd have to be eating such a wide variety of ferment of different fermented foods so consistently because these bacteria don't have a very long life. Um, so I do tend to encourage that if you are looking to cover your bases uh, for probiotics or paying attention to that realm, that supplements can be useful because it is easier to find. A, um, a thoughtfully created supplement with a variety of different probiotic bacteria, sometimes also with the prebiotics added to that supplement, making it easier to cover your bases than as if you were trying to get it just from food alone. Because um, for example, like kombucha, you know, I get a lot of questions about this one. And it, yes, it has probiotic bacteria, but it also tends to have a lot of sugar. Um, so yes, you're gonna get some probiotics, but the sugar might be counteracting some of those benefits. So that's just one example, because um, in order to you know, get enough of the probiotics, you probably have to have a lot of kombucha, which would be a lot of sugar. So um, you know, I, again, though, I think it's important to talk to your doctor about supplement use. But in terms of just incorporating them into foods, you know, I just have fun with it. Try a bunch of different ones and see what, see what appeals to you, and just play around with them, and just really enjoy. Um, but just to, again, be thoughtful about sodium, sugar, like a lot of yogurts, for example, have a lot of added sugar. So I do encourage choosing varieties without sugar whenever possible and just adding your own flavor. You know, I love cinnamon in yogurt or you can add fruit, you can add you new know, textures with like chia seeds and flax and nuts and stuff like that. So, you know, um, experimenting and making it enjoyable. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks for a wonderful evening. Would you like to share um, your contact, how they can contact the center? Yes. So let's see if we got this here. Um, yeah, so you can connect with us. Um, I, I run our Instagram, so we're at Valley Breast Center. Um, and you're also welcome to call our office um, as well. So we're, um, we're located at the Lucko Pavilion. Um, and you can reach us at 201-634-5557 uh, to schedule an appointment with a provider. 